Chapter 13 is a medical chapter that continues chronologically from Chapter 12. It covers from September 2018 to March 2018. I've said earlier that when I was going to A&E in London with those just episodes there were a couple of times when I had vomiting. All human beings have vomited at some point in their lives. But this was something terrible and agonizing. It was a different kind of vomiting. So, in these three months when I was living a nomadic life in paid hostels around Dublin city centre, I went twice to A&E at Mater Hospital with this kind of terrible vomiting. On the second occasion, when the nurse took my blood pressure, I noticed that my systolic reading was 250. When I commented on this, he said keep quiet. It was as though he wanted that hushed up because it was hospital policy to ignore my high blood pressure and not tell me and not give treatment. Am I right that this is medical neglect? I wonder if this is how they treat everyone who comes in with such a high systolic reading, or if they reserve such supreme indifference for them that are unworthy of life. I was asked to sit in a smaller waiting room inside the A&E where patients waited after intake, but all the chairs were occupied. They said they did not have a bed. I lay down on the floor. I recall being injected which I was later told was given to stop my vomiting. Well, I was delirious and I was knocking things down. I recall upsetting a grocery bag and a two-liter bottle of coke that was beside some patient. I recall losing my shoes and kept asking where my bag was, and the other patients kept asking me to touch my shoulder, and my bag hung there. They asked me to go home and I was not properly coordinated. I lacked hand-to-eye coordination and wasn't able to use my mobile to call a taxi. I knew I'd be better if I spent the night on the chairs outside. But the guards were violent as they would be too. A big strong guy. Eventually, they let me stay the night and I just sat in the chair very groggy. And then I went home in the morning after calling a taxi with my mobile. In November 2018 I was able to stay in Brew Hostel which is a homeless and free hostel. Brew was for druggies, but they admitted anyone. Because the druggies have no control over their consumption of tobacco or heroin, they were allowed to smoke inside the building. I mean, if they weren't allowed, they would still smoke and they would have to be evicted and sleep on the street because they didn't have any control. The migrants told me that I'm not an Irish citizen and that I'm not allowed to stay. There, they wished to force me to stay in unholy places where I was unable to shower. They weigh they lie and cover up for illiterate migrants, so it is really an inferiority support group. If you are Irish and want to know why I cannot leave Ireland if I feel they abuse me to backward migrants to boost them, I have two replies. Reply 1, your question is correct. And my answer is yes. You only need to read the back chapters to learn of the circumstances under which I came to Ireland. Inferiority clubs and abusive people exist in all countries. What is important is not to get caught up in one, unless you are an abject inferior. What I did not expect to see in Ireland, what I did not expect would be possible at any point on the globe would be a 100% watertight compartment. A max prison where even time going backwards can happen, but I'd never be able to speak to anyone but women and illiterates. Yes, I want to leave Ireland as I would any place where I am mistreated and isolated, by blackmailing me to be with paid listeners, and intimacy selling professionals or completely alone. Knowing there is nothing. But I have restrictions on where I can travel to, and how long I can visit. I could of course leave Ireland by jumping in the sea or going to some place a lot worse. Lawyers assured me I won't be deported to India if I can cry and weep about living ill and uncared for in a room in Ireland. I prefer suicide to being sent to India. 
So yes, I want to leave Ireland because they are torturing me. But I need help to get out or will need to get out by committing suicide. Reply mm. 2. This place must be an inferiority club if you want me to get out for not liking inferiority clubs. It is a lot more of an inferiority club if men put me down to illiterate women to raise their self-esteem. But the Dublin homeless shelters don't have any immigration or nationality-related restrictions. They are a Catholic charity founded by priests that will take anyone who has nowhere to go. But I had to call every day to sleep in the homeless shelters. I wasn't formally assigned a bed as rules. Made this possible only for Irish residents. With calling every day for a bed, there was a degree of uncertainty there may not be a bed on some nights. And so the homelessness, walking around all day because there is no place to sit unless you pay at a cafe. You can sit for an hour and when you have drunk your coffee, you have to go. What about the food? I am vegetarian by habit, and Irish. Food is crap for me. I feel sicker from wandering due to my medical conditions. But most other homeless people, the Irish, even the young ones have a bunch of medical conditions worse than me. From being homeless, it was certainly a blessing away from the cold. Well, on one occasion I got quite sick while in Brew Hostel. So they called them ambulance to take me away to St. James Hospital. They initially thought I had an infectious disease at St. James Hospital, so they isolated me. Now I have nerves that hurt. I mean someone told me they had a pain clinic at St. James so why don't you ask them to analyze your pain? But no I was having vertigo and you know. Always twitching my body because I had pricking sensations in random places of my body. I felt like the bed was moving even rotating. Now they tell me it is vertigo. Despite explaining, they felt I was crazy because I was twitching. They asked a psychiatrist to see me and I told him I don't like it here I wish I could die the gentleman called another psychiatrist was a female and both of them interviewed me. They decided they didn't want to force any drugs only but they kept me detained. Well I just wasn't allowed to leave the ward. If I did a staff member would come with me so that I didn't run away I was detained therefore but not sectioned. During my three weeks stay in St. James Hospital they decided that I did not have an infectious disease and said they wanted to do a CT scan of my heart then they told me that the CT scan had come out completely normal I asked them how come I'm having all these just problems the doctor answered well you have a touch of heart failure the time and date was December 2018 I think his name was Dr. Quinn I mean they finished my detention after the CT scan. They said the psychiatrist said I can go home. Dr. Quinn wrote a prescription for me. It was not forced. It was intended for use after my discharge. The prescription wanted me to take five tablets of Haldol every day. I mean I don't know the dosage. Now I remember. Oh. When I was in America, I was detained by INS, Immigration and Naturalization Services USA. They wanted to punish people who were complaining too much about detention conditions, and they moved me to this horror facility. There you had to obey officers' orders, and if you disobeyed the silliest order, you would get a punishment injection. The punishment injection was terrible and caused suffering. For example, I was injected to go for smokes with the females. They provided cigarettes free of charge. Detainees had a good reason to obey officers' orders like a slave, to avoid that injection. I know some people don't believe me. But that's all right. I'm going to give you the name of that place too. It's called Columbia Care Center, in Columbia, South Carolina. I asked the CCC staff at some point, what the punishment injection was. They said the content varied, but the current psychiatrist recommended a mixture of Haldol and Adovan. Therefore, the punishment injection we received was a mixture of Haldol and Adovan.
Now I told you in December 2018 I had had much experience with having cardiac episodes. I was sure held all tablets so give me a heart attack even though I have never tried them. I mean later, Dr. Quinn denied say telling me that I had a touch of heart failure. He may have seen it in the CT scan of my heart, by the way I had an echo done in August 2017 in London as already said. I think the 2017 echo showed that I have heart failure. It said on there the left ventricle was slower than the right one, which I understand, uh, I think they want to make a mystery out of my illness. They want to go in circles and say all kinds of things. After discharge from St. James Hospital, I continued to stay at Brew Hostel until at some point it was closed down. In March 2019, I was taken once again from Brew Hostel to St. James Hospital at the request of the GP that was examining me. There they diagnosed pneumonia, but they kept it a secret from me. They may have thought I have a low intelligence and cannot pronounce a long word like pneumonia, or it might be the policy to keep all these things secret from me. Anyway, after I got discharged against medical advice, I mean, I get sick of staying in any hospital. They gave me a prescription, and it said I had the pneumonia thing. Walking all over the place in the dark crying and trying to find the shelter they had assigned me at 10 o'clock in the night. Getting away in the bus from St. James Hospital, with women trying to finger me finger me finger me, instead of leaving me alone. Those parasites can only make me worse, having the needle cannula in my arm since the nurse forgot to take it off. I did everything I needed to do, but they started complaining and yelling on the phone, all because it was their mistake. You know when they make a mistake, you bear the burden. I feel I would be mostly okay if doctors wouldn't tell me I'm normal, if other migrant women will stop fingering me in buses.